Pyotr Yang grew up in the shipping town of Dudinka in northern Siberia, beyond the Arctic Circle, on the bank of the Yenisei River. This is a place that just looks like the edge of the earth. The winter is unrelenting. Eight months of the year have an average temperature below freezing, and six weeks are spent immersed in the complete darkness of polar night. I'd imagine for many in Dudinka, the vodka flows like water. They probably brush their teeth with it. There's large portions of the population for whom this type of bleak outlook is miserable and hard to endure. The opportunities in the region aren't much more forgiving than the temperature. Siberia is extremely rich in natural resources, and a lot of the work revolves around the extraction and shipping of those minerals. It was in this type of icy environment that Pyotr Yan's fiery temper and fondness for violence first emerged. It's fair to assume that anyone who becomes a UFC champion is uniquely suited to their vocation. But Pyotr Yan was born to fight, and it was a problem. As he describes, at school I fought at every break. He seemed to confirm on the Helwani hour that he sometimes fought up to six times a day. Uh, you said that you used to fight like six times a day when you were in, uh, a, a, a youngster in school. Six times a day? Why were you fighting so much? Why were you so angry? No, I wasn't angry. I wasn't angry, you know. I just moved from the village to the city. I was a new guy and a lot of the city boys were trying to pick, pick up on me. So I just had to stand my ground. Yan claims he wasn't angry, but by all accounts, very little preamble before them fists were flying around all over the fucking place. Dragging his ass home from school covered in cuts and bruises became the norm. It must have felt like sending him off to war every morning. And it wasn't just at school. Yan was constantly fighting on the street. He later described that the wild and unpredictable nature of street fights helped him enormously in his career. 100% street fighting can help your MMA career. It's great experience. The street is the place where the gong is not turned on, where there is no referee or weight categories. Sometimes you have to survive. I never had a choice with whom to fight, so I am ready to take on any opponent. And of course, if you've had a hundred street fights, the prospect of a violent altercation in the cage is gonna seem as civilized as tea and crumpets with the Queen of England. And so mentally, Jan has always been ready for war. While these no bell, no rules fight for survival against every available, able-bodied kid in the greater Dudinka area was great experience for his future vocation, it was obviously concerning for his parents, who were eventually warned by his teachers that Pyotr was barreling full speed down the road to ruin, and that steps must be taken to divert his violent nature away from the streets. He himself admits one likely outcome was prison. No, maybe, yeah, Siberian upstairs, закалка, знаешь, оно, конечно же, дает, дает очень много, потому что вспоминаешь, там, например, часто, ну, а вот эта ситуация была так, а там вот ты там, например, столько драк было, ты дрался там, за что можно было и в тюрьму сесть. Тут, в принципе, ты работаешь, ты. So it's that familiar story we often hear: not being able to tame Pyotr's behavior. They tried to divert his energy in his sport. But you know, that's such an easy thing to say that glosses over the reality of the situation. Oh, we'll just divert his energy in his sport. It sounds so simple, but you know, there was a million worried conversations where his parents were like, what the fuck is wrong with this kid? Six times a day? He didn't get that from my side, the family. It sounds like a nightmare. They first tried putting him in football, gymnastics, and wrestling, but Yan eventually and predictably settled on Taekwondo before discovering his first true love. When Pyotr was 11, his brother, who was four years older, took up boxing. And Pyotr describes a pretty deep yearning to get involved. Now, this is a really incredible quote. I watched him return home from boxing, beaten up and tortured, and I envied him. There's kind of a masochistic element to that quote. 
Let's just say Jan is lucky his brother never started training how to be a dominatrix. Otherwise, we'd have never heard of him. Now, that is the quote of a little savage, but he couldn't convince his brother to take him along to the gym. So Jan took matters into his own hands. I had to be smart. Once I spied what things he was putting together, I put the same things in a bag, waited until he left the apartment, and five minutes later, I quietly followed him. I got to my brother's coach, Nikolai Surzikov. It was a small basement. After the first workout, I barely hobbled from there to the house. Two weeks later, I already performed at the first competition and won. Nikolai could see the potential, even at that early stage. I immediately told everybody he would be a champion. He was a leader, like his brother. They were always followed, and their childhood was not easy. Pyotr was small, but you can already see this is a man who thinks. He is 12 or 13 years old, and already an adult. Pyotr wasn't just mature in terms of demeanor. He was already working to contribute money to his family. He was the sixth of eight kids, but they weren't poor. As Pyotr describes, mom was in business. She had her own shop, a furniture store. We had a big house. We then lived together with my father. We were engaged in housekeeping. Everything was in order. But watching his parents work hard to provide for a huge family gave him an appreciation of money and a sense of responsibility for his younger siblings. За мной старшие также присматривают, потому что мама там, например, часто работала. Также я потом там за своими младшими, за кем-то старался присматривать, потому что понимал, ну, это, во-первых, ты раньше взрослеешь, во-вторых, многим вещам ты знаешь ценности и знаешь, как что достается. Но я думаю, что для меня это сыграло огромную, так скажем, школу жизни. And so at 12, he set up a pump to draw water from a nearby lake in order to wash cars. At 14, he got a real man's job, unloading barges in the freezing cold at 14. Jesus Christ, tough work. On the dock, Pyotr caught the attention of a man named Konstantin, who noticed that Pyotr, a small boy of 14, could easily drag heavy loads that full-grown men couldn't handle. Konstantin met a pretty horrible ending that kind of underscores the harsh nature of the Arctic Circle. He went out fishing on the ice one day and simply vanished. All they found afterwards was his jacket. Nobody knows exactly what happened, but he was basically gobbled up by the ice. Years before his demise, Konstantin had spoken to a master of sports and highly regarded boxing coach in the nearby city of Omsk, named Yuri Demchenko. As Demchenko tells it, Konstantin and Pyotr worked on the Yenisei River, unloading barges. Konstantin said there was a boy who was 14 years old and he, along with adults, dragged bags of 50 or 60 kilos. Pyotr then wanted to earn money for his family and at the same time was engaged in boxing. Konstantin asked me to look out for him. Pyotr's boxing coach had also recommended that Pyotr go to Omsk. With this advice and Konstantin's introduction to Demchenko, at 15, Pyotr left his home and family to live in a huge city alone and pursue more seriously the goal of becoming a boxer. He was met at the train station by Demchenko, who helped him move into a hostel. Yan continued in school and trained with Demchenko in the evenings. Financially, he received support from his mother, but it's not Pyotr's nature to ever want to feel like a burden. It's very obvious he much prefers to be the man people can depend on, even before he was a man. That kind of sums Pyotr up. He's a serious individual, so he tried to make money any way he could. As Demchenko recalls, I remember one winter in Omsk, they bought a heater dragged it around the yards, helped warm up and start cars. And that's how they made money. When Pyotr finished school, he enrolled in the Siberian Institute of Physical Culture and Sports. By this time, he was working as a bouncer in a nightclub. Atlantida, 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 Atlantida. Do you know the power of a saxophone? The soul of jazz? The bass of jazz. <laughs> Jan wouldn't be sidetracked by the life. He was single-minded in his determination. I was not annoyed by the atmosphere of a nightclub, that everyone around was drinking. Somehow I didn't pay attention. At that time, there was another task, to go out, win, and earn your pennies. I myself have always tried to adhere to a healthy lifestyle. Didn't smoke, didn't drink, exercised. It was this self-discipline that got me to where I am today. Pyotr is just a fucking hard-working grafter by nature. That's just who the guy is. The club would provide another avenue for Yan to earn, 
and for the first time monetize his love of violence in a really wild way. In the Atlantis Club, there were fights every Tuesday. They quickly set up a ring, we fought, the ring was instantly removed, and a disco began at the same time. As one of his friends elaborated, on Tuesdays there were small tournaments called butterflies. Absolutely everyone came out. Kickers, thighs, boxers, melee, everyone was fighting amongst themselves. If they did not find an opponent, someone comes out of the crowd and fights. So it's the thigh boxer versus the postman. For these fights, Yang could earn about 4,000 rubles, or 50 bucks. One interesting detail here is that Yan was initially helped by his mother, but as soon as he could, he was sending money home to support his family. Beyond that, Yan saved up to buy a car, and he used that car to cruise around picking up chicks. Oh, yeah, no. He saved up, bought a car, and then gave that car to his brother, because he felt his brother needed it more than he did. And you really have to respect that. I mean, this guy was studying, training, fighting, working late in nightclubs, supporting himself, sending money home, and on top of all that, he basically gave his savings to his brother. All the articles suggest that his family weren't exactly poor. So this must have just felt like a matter of duty. He instinctively put the needs of his family above his own. You know, the guy might have been a handful as a child, but long before he was making good money, he was a resourceful, dependable rock for his family. I don't even like mentioning his wife because Yan has a very particular set of skills and he might find me and he might kill me. I mean, that's on the cards. I'm just saying, if this is my last video, you know what happened. But interesting story that illustrates the direct, no-nonsense manner in which Yan handles situations is how the couple met. When he was 19, he saw a profile on some social media site and it was love at first click. Yan sent her a succinct message, hello, which isn't out of the pickup artist handbook. You're meant to open with a neck. Hello fatty would have been better. Put him on the back foot. Exploit flaws in her hotness. So it could be her eyebrows being too thin, her teeth being too big, her stubby feet, her guy hands. You want to exploit these. Now I can't stand that pickup crap. How to trick a lady into thinking you're someone worth going to bed with. It's bullshit. And that simple hello got the ball rolling and they eventually met up. On the first meeting, Yan stated his feelings about her and she reciprocated. But Yan's girl is very pretty. I mean, an extremely attractive lady. And naturally, she had a number of men trying to impress her. Now, Yan didn't exactly threaten these guys. No, he's a gentleman. Instead, he gave them an open invitation. As one article tells it, he quickly let them know what he could do with them if they agreed to meet him in person. However, he did not threaten them with violence, but offered to meet him in a fair duel. Now that just sounds like the 19th century. Pistols are fists, your choice. And it's kind of a funny idea. You know, she's thinking, sorry, what are you doing? You two guys are gonna fight, and then what happens? I'm just in a relationship with the winner? I mean, what the fuck is going on here? Unsurprisingly, there were no takers. But just to make absolutely sure there were no snakes hanging on with little sneaky DMs, Yan bought her a new phone with a new SIM card to take her off the market. They couldn't reach her if they wanted, but even if they could, they'd have a hot-headed shit kicker who fights for fun to contend with. It would take more than some nice poetry and a box of chocolates to get this girl. Yan probably delivered her one of these guys still beating hearts in a box for Valentine's Day. It sounds heavy-handed, but obviously, a lot of young ladies would love the idea of a macho ass kicker inviting all comers to take their shot. And in this case, the proof is in the pudding. They've been together ever since, happily married with two kids. Very hard to out-alpha that story. How'd you court your wife? Well, I tried to organize a bloody, bare-knuckle street fighting tournament with her as the first prize, but unfortunately, nobody would accept my challenge, so... We do have one story of him defending himself and his girlfriend. The two were out the front of their building, and Yan tells his story himself. It's a bit embarrassing to even talk about it. We sat in the front yard and talked. Then drunk guys came up. There was two of them, about 35 years old. And word for word, they said, take out your wallet and get out of here. Very rude in general. I took them aside and started talking to them. There was a small hill and it turned out I was standing lower. Taking this into account, they were one and a half times taller than me. I moved back a couple of steps so that we would be on the same level in height. And when we were equal, this big one said some very rude words. I hit him exactly in the jaw and he fell in the front garden. Listen, you ask me to tell such stories, I tell. 
beautiful, righteous administration of street justice if I've ever heard it. What you get from those stories of his family and his wife is a guy who holds a couple people dearly and in every sense is prepared to fight his fucking ass off to protect and provide for those people. Knocking that asshole out is one thing, but the real standout story here is grafting and saving up his money to buy his brother that car. That is a pretty significant gesture considering this was long before Yan was making big money. It says a lot about the guy. At this point, Yan was still focused on boxing, training and competing in tournaments with the hopes of eventually reaching the Olympics. In the city, there was an MMA gym, the Alexander Nevsky Club. These guys would sometimes show up to Demchenko's gym to fine-tune their boxing, only to get tuned up by Pyotr. They were like, yeah, that's great, but why not come over to MMA and we'll whoop your ass all over the fucking place? Pyotr happily obliged, dipping his toe into MMA for the first time. A confluence of factors would see Jan finally hang up the boxing gloves for good. The rising popularity of MMA, the ability to actually get paid, unlike in amateur boxing, a growing boredom with the sweet science, and a desire to mix in all styles are all factors Pyotr has spoken about. But the biggest factor was that he simply felt his career in boxing was being hampered by corruption and incompetence. The final nail in the boxing coffin came in the Youth of Russia tournament, when Pyotr, who was already jaded with robberies and injustice, was unfairly deducted a point in the final of the tournament. As he describes, I just couldn't cope with my emotions, took off my gloves and threw it at the judge's table. Even though I was leading on points, winning two rounds, even my coach Demchenko supported me at that moment. Ahead on points, Yam was disqualified and promptly changed lanes permanently. With very little training before his debut, Yan showcased his power and smashed the fuck out of his first opponent. And the victory impressed the premier Russian martial arts organization, ACB. Lots of the UFC's Russian talent has come through ACB. They immediately entered Yan into their Bantamweight tournament, which was a tall order for a guy with one fucking fight. By this point, Yan had began training in Tiger Muay Thai in Thailand and was mixing techniques from Taekwondo, boxing and Muay Thai. In only his second pro fight, he took on the 23-8 Brazilian veteran and grappling specialist Renato Velame. Yan used his strength to keep the fight standing, wore Renato down with relentless pressure on the feet and took the decision in style as the Brazilian waned. Excellent win at this point in his career, and that relentless suffocating pressure on the feet would possibly become Yan's biggest weapon. The guy is a workhorse. He got his first and only pro submission in the semi-final, securing a guillotine in 47 seconds. He then took a fight in a smaller promotion in Omsk against some poor fucking debutant. This was Arthur Mirzakanyan's first and only pro fight. A brutal 2 minute 40 second demolition was enough for him to reevaluate the direction of his life. Yan knocked him out of the sport. Full of confidence on the heels of two quick finishes, Pyotr returned to ACB for the final of the Bantamweight tournament against the undefeated 5-0 Chechen wrestler Murad Kalimov. Kalimov attempted to smother Yan, but he just couldn't keep up with the pace. Yan poured on the pressure and gradually snuffed the fight out of him. Winning the tournament gave Yan a shot at the ACB Bantamweight champion, Magomed Magomedov, an undefeated 10-0 grappler from Dagestan, who would test Pyotr's game to the limit. This fight was a fucking war, but right from the opening bell, Pyotr was holding his own, and as the fight wore on, his cardio again became the decisive factor. By the final round, both men had tired, but the fight ended with Yan attempting a submission on a battered, bloody, and exhausted Magomed. Amazing fight, and Yan was the clear winner. Had it not been for a headbutt in the dying seconds of the fight, Yan was deducted a point. Even with that penalty, the fight was a majority draw. Two judges had it even, the other gave it to Magomed. But because there was a belt on the line, they needed a winner, and so Magomedov got the nod. To this day, the only losses on Yan's record are basically losses to himself for failing to comply with the rules. He is capable of costing himself enormously in the biggest fights of his life. We already have two examples of that before he even entered the UFC. Yan bounced back with a decision win over British standout Ed Arthur. Pyotr put on a clinic, but what was notable was a clear emphasis on his grappling. In order to fully round out his game, he executed a number of perfect throws and takedowns. Following the win, he was given the big rematch. 
just a year after his loss, he now represented a more complete fighter. And this time, there were no mistakes. Yan's stand-up was backed up by a brilliant takedown defense, which gave him the freedom to really open up on the feet. Beyond that, he was often the one pushing the grappling offense. Magomed gradually tired, and it became clear Yan now had his number. In this fight, he showed the full arsenal of an elite martial artist. Clinch work, takedowns, sweeps, and the usual relentless barrage of diverse strikes he uses to wear his opponents the fuck out. Most impressive, he showed an ability to evolve and make critical adjustments in a very short time frame. Magomed survived, but Yang got the victory, took the belt, and looked absolutely world-class in the process. This win put him in a great position. He was a young, developing fighter with a belt, earning great money, about $50,000 a fight, and was quickly building a name for himself in Russia as an exciting fan favorite. But Yan had bigger plans for himself. After knocking out Mateus Matos in his only title defense, he was offered a blunt ultimatum by the organization, either sign a new contract or vacate your title. Yan dropped the belt like it was made out of shit. He took a risk, but it was a risk that paid off and he signed his UFC contract in January 2018, just three years after his MMA debut. He now had all the tools necessary to compete at an elite level. He was ready to establish himself at the top of the sport, and do so in a relentless, ferocious fucking manner. When you look at Pyotr's story, it's clear the guy is above all a pragmatist. He fights because he was born to brawl, but he views the sport first and foremost as a business and an opportunity to be the man others can depend on. Where he once bought his brother a car, he's now building a big family home for his mother. No, во-первых, если бы я не любил это, наверное, я тоже бы это не делал. Первый момент, второй момент. Да, это помочь тоже близким. Ну и третий момент, уже сегодня я понимаю, где я, также я и себе помогаю, я уже понимаю, что спортивный век, он небольшой, это буквально 4-5 лет, и также я буду неинтересен в спорте. Вот, за это время, раз уже здесь, надо укрепиться, чтобы после можно было тоже чем-то заниматься. Пьотр came from the ice cold conditions of Siberia, worked his fucking ass off. He rolled with the punches and made adjustments or changed his plan whenever necessary. His approach to life is very much his approach to fighting, to always continue moving forward swinging, making the most out of every opportunity that presents itself. And this practical, workmanlike approach to the sport is mirrored in his attitude. He never speaks in grandiose terms. He doesn't romanticize his own life. He doesn't pedestalize any potential opponents. And when those around him try to take Pyotr on a nostalgic trip down memory lane, he's just not interested. Телевидение, там вот эти всякие вот кому нужно какой-то вот рядом побыть вот это мне нужна молодежь, мне нужны молодежь, мне нужны пацаны, не знаю там кто кого я знаю, кто хочет быть для кого возможно я каким-то являюсь там небольшим мотиватором, примером мне это важно. А вот когда начинаю там писать какие-то вещи, там, помнишь, не помнишь, вот это вот глупые вещи, вот это просто. Пьотр Ян is kind of an old-fashioned hard man in that regard. There's nothing abstract about his motivations. They're all very grounded. He's described wanting to squeeze every bit of potential out of his prime, earn what he can, and secure life for his family. And in those very practical, no-nonsense endeavors, I would not like to be the man standing in this guy's way. Class 